Today, it is my pleasure to bring up today's speaker, and boy, when I heard who it was this morning, I got pretty excited. Because you know what? He is a vessel, people. He opens his mouth, and he lets the Holy Spirit lead him in what to say. So let's give a warm Church in the Park welcome to my friend and brother, Pete Doyle. All right, here we go. Everyone can hear me clearly? All right, today we're going to try to do two things which I've never been able to do. Exercise and eat healthy. <laughs> I'm just joking. All right, I'm going to try to speak briefly, and I'm going to try not to be too obnoxious. <laughs> but I can't promise you about the obnoxious stuff because this is my personality. The Lord will use what he does, right? Yeah. So, so you guys give me a, a brief moment to get my stuff together. And... uh. If anybody got a Bible and you want to follow along, uh, you may have never heard of this man or never heard of this book. And if so, you might uh, want to consider reading your Bible a little more. But uh, it's in the Old Testament, and it's somewhere in the middle between uh, Psalms and Genesis or so. So you just flip it up like the third or something, you might be able to find it. Uh, and it's a book of Nehemiah. It's Nehemiah chapter 8. You don't need to really worry about... Uh, Finding it right at this moment because I'm going to uh, get obnoxious for a few and then we'll look at the word. So uh, first and foremost, we will get our stuff together here. We'll pray. Okay, Lord, hallelujah. The out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants will proclaim your name because you are holy and righteous and you have so much forbearance, so much patience and love and kindness toward each one of us sitting here today or standing here serving or sitting out there in the outskirts. Lord, everyone who can hear my voice, let them know how much you love them today, Lord. Uh, nurture to their soul. Speak to their soul. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a mind that can receive your word. We thank you for your word. Lord, speak to us through your word, and we ask you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I'm going to ask a few questions. Usually I pace back and forth, but uh, that's pretty annoying to Daniel. He films it, and so he just gets very frustrated. <laughs> He's, he sent me death threats the other day, but hey, it's all right. I'm going to live forever. So uh, here we go. A few questions It's just for you to ponder, you to consider, you to think about. I don't want you to blot out any answers or whatever, yell it out. If you feel compelled to, do so, but uh, whatever, it's nothing. So here we go. First question is, what is the difference between Christianity and other major world religions or cults or different things like that, right? What is the mark of a Christian, the proof, the seal of a Christian? What is the difference between Christians and regular folks? secular or, or just neighbors or whoever have you, right, co-workers, people you bump into at the mission or on the street. And what makes a believer strong and effective in their faith? It's a three-letter word. The three-letter word is joy. Joy. Okay. Their joy in the Lord Joy is the difference maker. It's joy. See, joy is defined as an intense happiness, like a, a, it's a feeling of, of, of great pleasure and happiness. It's emotion. But in, in this uh, biblical uh, definition of joy, that's not fitting. Joy, I'll, I'll give you a spiritual definition I came up with, because happiness is circumstantial. It derives or from, from the word happenings, depends on what happens to you. Yeah, you're real happy because something good happened to you. Joy, not so. It's different. Joy, my dear brothers and sisters, it's a foundation. My spiritual uh, definition of joy is it's a hybrid feeling. Joy is where hope meets peace, and it's uh, blended with love. With, with a pinch of some good cheer. Amen. Yes, amen. Joy is the foundation for a Christian soul. 
If you're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ and you have faith, strong faith, you have joy. No matter what happens to you, you rejoice in the Lord. You have joy. It's like an exuberance. It's an inner uh, uh, feeling to rejoice, to, to come up from within. It's coming inside out of you. You see the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness depends on what happens to us. Joy from the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. All right, so try to, st try to stay focused on the goal. Minimal obnoxiousness today, right? Here we go. Well, yo, here we go. Why do Christians have joy? Because of the love. Yeah, that's an awesome point. Very legit. But actually, joy is God's gift. It's a fruit. It's a byproduct of the spirit of God living in you and amongst you. See, the fruit of the uh, spirit, what is it? Love, joy, peace, patience, right? Joy is a gift of God. Why do Christians have joy? Thank you, Lord. It's a perspective. Joy, we receive joy from our outlook. You know what? This ain't all there is. Though today might be a little crummy, you leave here, something bad happens, uh, uh, something terrible happens, right? This is not all there is. We got something good in store for us, something beyond the clouds. All right, so you see, Christians have joy because it's God's gift, but it's because our outlook, you know, this right here, snap of a finger, blink of an eye. Yeah, it, it might have been kind of crappy. Might have been kind of bad hand. Might have had a rough few years, 20 years, your whole life, 50 years, 100 years. Might have been pretty bad, but guess what? You got something good in store for you. You got something in heaven. Come on. Right? You see, what's a joyful person like? I'll tell you what. First off, a joyful person is a pleasure to be around. You guys ever been around a, uh, a, a bad person? <laughs> Damn. Hmm. Pretty annoying. I know because I'm one. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so look. Joyful people have like the energy of, of, of life. See, God gave life. And a joyful person has a connection to almighty God to where, to where when they speak or when they talk or th they bump shoulders with you or good gesture you, you feel the energy. You feel the love. You feel the compassion. It's the joy. And guess what? That joy is contagious because what do they say? Misery loves company. Well, sh I want to be around some joyful people, you know, because I'm pretty miserable enough. No, I'm joking. Here we go. So look, you see, a joyful person is a pleasure to be around. A joyful person got a little more life than regular folk. A little more life than regular folk. You bump into them and you're like, ah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cleansing. Feels real good. But. If you're a Christian and you're a believer in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you need to give him glory. Say, so you know what? The reason why I got this outlook, you know what? The reason why I got this perspective, you know what? The reason why I feel real good right now, it's not because of something I did. It's not because I'm making sure I'm doing outweighing the good with the bad. It's because of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So look, but, but remember, happiness depends on what happens to you. Happiness is circumstantial, but in a sense, joy can be somewhat circumstantial. See, circumstances can make us ignorantly, accidentally set our joy aside. I could say, you know what? I'm going to put this joy down today without even knowing. It can happen in a brief second. You see, circumstances make us trade in our joy at times. We'll trade in the joy for stress. Stress is no good. It's bad for your mind, bad for your physical body. See, what do you say? Well, which one of you by uh, could add anything to you? One moment of stress, right? So stress, or, or you could trade in your joy for loss. You, you had loss of a loved one, lost a job, lost uh, something that was really dear to you. And what was once joy transforms into depression. That's pretty much the opposite of joy, to be depressed. See, and they usually stem from hardship. We all go through hard times. We all go through hard times. He didn't uh, promise everything would be all uh, peaches and cream. Everything would be all gravy. He said, look, in this world, you're going to encounter a little tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer, right. for he has overcome the world. Right. So look, we can sell our joy at times. 
we could exchange our joy in, get a little guilt, a little shame. And we usually do that with sin. We all have a sinful nature. We're all going to fall short of the glory of God. That doesn't give us a license for immorality. That doesn't give us an excuse to go dumb and do whatever we please. We have to be obedient if we want to receive this joy. There's a responsibility that comes along with it. You see, we exchange or trade our joy in for our sin. Which brings us to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah never changed his joy in for sin. But Nehemiah... He knew what's up. So look. The Lord used Nehemiah, I think it was roughly 500 B.C. So what was that, 2,500 years ago about, right? 2,500 years ago, the Lord spoke through this man, and he had something to tell us today. I don't even know what the date is. December 7th, right? So 2014. Yeah, yeah. Look. So something that was spoken through the Lord, through the mouth of one of his servants, was so relevant, so applicable, so real for your Christian faith today. That's the word of God. It's only the word of God. It's living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. All right, so look. So we're going to talk about Nehemiah chapter 8. If anybody found that, that's impressive because it would have took all this whole time to find it. But uh, good job. But I'm going to still give you a few moments left. Look, see, context. Look, Jerusalem was in ruins. Uh, They have a wall in Jerusalem. Their wall was like a a brilliant fortress built around, kind of like to keep them safe from enemies and and, and attacks, right? So Jerusalem was besieged by the Babylonians. They came in, and they wrecked shop. You know, they took them out. They they took them into captivity. They pretty much burnt down the city, destroyed it, right? And then they they ruined that wall. You see... The Israelites were took captive to Babylon. And in Babylon, this great special man right here, Nehemiah, became a servant to the king. It was King Xerxes. He was, uh, I think, the king of Persia. Nehemiah was his cupbearer. You see, Nehemiah, he had his joy in the Lord. So the Lord gave favor on his life. So he was the cupbearer. That means he came through with the drink, right? You got to like that. So look, so one day, Nehemiah came in there and usually got the joy of the Lord, right? He comes in and says, King, here's your drink. Drink up. King, live forever, right? This time he comes in like this. Here's your cup, King. Live forever. So the king said, he seen him. He said, whoa, Nehemiah, what's your problem, man? So look, he said, Nehemiah, I can see that you ain't sick. You ain't got the Ebola. You ain't got nothing, right? So I know that this must be a sickness, a sadness of your heart. So Nehemiah poured it out to him and said, look, king, I just got news. I got news that my people went back over there to, uh, to Jerusalem, and they seen that the wall had been destroyed. So, so Nehemiah was heavily grieved. But guess what? The Lord gave favor to Nehemiah. And, and the, king, the king said, you know what, Nehemiah? Why don't you take your, go back over there and go fix that wall? So Nehemiah said, cool. So he went, right? But, but the story ain't over. It was pretty rough. Nehemiah encountered some uh, some interesting opposition, you know, some little death threats here and there, right, from surrounding cities or what have you, people who had problems with uh, the Israelites, people of Jerusalem. So where he goes over there, to ha- he starts building that wall, handling the work. People send him letters saying, you know what, you might be having a good time building that wall, thinking that you guys are going to go back to everything, going good and merry in your little city, but we hate you, and I'm pretty sure we're going to kill you before you get done. So he's like, ugh, he's pretty upset about that, a little uh, stressed out, right? And then uh, not to mention he starts having to deal with the people who's friction in between themselves while they're building. The, uh, some people are mad over this, some people are mad over that. They're all upset, right? So he has drama within, drama outside, and then uh, it gets to the point where some man comes with a message saying, you know what? I said, we're going to creep up on you while you're fixing that wall. We're going to kill you. You know, mouth, face-to-face type stuff. So Nehemiah overwhelmed. It was to the point where the workers were, were hammering on that wall with one hand, holding the pistol in the other. They was looking around like, ready? Right? But guess what? It was a time, such a rough time. But Nehemiah kept it together through faith. And Nehemiah rebuilt the broken wall. 
See, yo, it was a time of vulnerability, a time of great trouble and distress, a time of great affliction and reproach. Those people coming at them, right? It was hard times, drama with Nehemiah, but he kept the faith and stayed strong. So guess what? We're going to listen to what he has to say. Because he has experiential knowledge. He knows what was going. He knows how to stay focused on faith. And guess what he has to say for us? Chapter 8, verse 10, the book of Nehemiah. Towards the latter part of the verse, he says, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Come on. Listen to Nehemiah. Do not be sorrowful. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Our strength, our power, our perspective, our witness to way people see us, our hope, our faith, it's all interwoven and intertwined to our joy. People see your joy. Liven up. Look alive out there, right? People see the joy of the Lord. See, to keep it real, though, Hard times, right? Hard times. They take away the joy. And the joy becomes elusive. And it easily slips away before we even know it. You see, thank the Lord for uh, great uh, men of God like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul gave us a further exhortation. Guess what he says? give you a little context about this man. He, he, he started a little church, I think, in Philippi, and uh, he's writing them a letter uh, saying, saying, hey, you Philippians, hey, it's what up? It's Paul. And then he's saying all this stuff, you know, giving them some spiritual insight and knowledge, and he's, guess where he's at? He, he's telling them, he's saying, rejoice in the Lord, y'all. Rejoice in the Lord, right? He's, he's probably in like his, his mini mansion, you know, got the uh, umbrella drinks. He, he's just relaxing, right? No. The apostle Paul is in prison, chained to a wall. And he's writing to this church saying, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. You see, that, that's the Apostle Paul. He's telling us today, church, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Memorize it. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Why did he say it again? Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Why? Why did he say it again? Because you know what? He know what? We know what? In life, we have good days and bad days. We got good times and bad times. We have ups and downs, right? See, he said rejoice again after initially saying rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice because there's such importance and emphasis. And importance to rejoice in the Lord. You see, because joy dips out. It's gone. We rejoice in the Lord. See, it's Sunday, so you know what we got to talk about on Sunday. Football. Come on, right? Nah, look at this. Detroit Lions. Hey, listen close. NFL legend. You guys don't know about this guy. NFL legend, Barry Sanders, number 20, little running back. They turned around and handed off to him, right? Check it out. Uh, he had people surrounding him about to tackle him. Somehow, by the Lord, this little man spins out. He's gone. They had him in his hands, and he's gone. Down the sideline, touchdown. Barry Sanders, in essence, he's so elusive, so tricky. It's like they had his hands on him, and then he's gone. Joy is Barry Sanders. You understand? Joy is Barry Sanders. It, it can be so elusive. You can have it one moment, and then something happens. But look, don't get it twisted. Joy and happiness are not the same thing. You could get, oh, I was going to say bad words. Uh, you could get angry or upset, right? Then your happiness leaves. Big whoop. Nothing can take away your joy in Jesus Christ. It is something that he's placed in there. It's in there. The problem is, for some odd reason, we want to take the joy and be like, I'm going to set it on the table real quick. and go." Come on. Here we go. 
Look, to rejoice, it implies that joy could slip away. But we have to be disciplined enough in our Christian life that we regain our joy in Jesus Christ. Whenever we call on him, we regain it. You see, it can never be taken away no matter what happens. A disciplined Christian rejoices. You see, what is it to rejoice, though? What is it to rejoice? To rejoice, I would say, would be like to regain, right? Or re-up. Come on. To reestablish your joy. You better reestablish it today, church. Question is, though, how do I rejoice? How is somebody to rejoice? You want to know what I do? Amen. You know what I do? To rejoice. I remember. I remember who he is. I remember he is faithful. I remember that he takes care of all these things. I remember he has plans for you, plans to prosper you, not plans to harm you. He has good stuff in store for you. I remember that nothing could separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing at all. Nothing could separate you from his love. Yo, I remember. I remember when he called me out of darkness into his wonderful light. I remember when he bore the cross for me in my place. I remember that he stayed up there and he said, it is finished. I remember that he rose again. And I remember that he's sitting at the right hand of Almighty God, interceding for me on my behalf. Yo, but look at this. The word of God tells us it's a command. First Thessalonians chapter 5, I think it's verse 16. The Apostle Paul again, still in prison, shouldn't be doing so much crime. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Look, check it out. What I say, you don't want to do the time, don't do the crime. No, look, I'm joking. He was a good dude. Guess what he said to us? He commanded us, church. Guess what his commandment is? Remember, he already exhorted us, already said, y'all better rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Don't make me take off my belt. Look, he said, he said, be joyful always. Not on good days. Always. But to tell you what, joy is spiritual stuff right there. We got to stay focused on Jesus Christ and we'll be in good shape. Joy. Yo, because in essence, in reality, like, like Nehemiah, we're vulnerable. Yo, we're, we're, it's hard to rejoice while we're trying to rebuild these walls and, uh, in our life, right? And while we're being under attack from enemies like stress or hardship, right, or, or struggles or fear or depression or the guilt and shame and discouragement that comes from our own sin. Pretty hard to rejoice when that's going on. But guess what? We do not rejoice in our circumstances. We rejoice in our Lord and our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now, here we go. I don't, I can't stand here before you and say, let, let, let's, whatever, right? I don't want you to be ignorant of the devil's schemes. His schemes is this. He has goals. It's like we all have goals. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, the, uh, the, the word of the Lord. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ himself tells us, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life. And have it abundant, Hallelujah. have it fully, have it all the way. So think about it. The thief, that's Satan, that's the devil. That's the opposing force in our life. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to kill your witness to where people see you and say, I don't want nothing what he's selling. And he wants to destroy your life. Lord rebuke him. But we have to be, we can't be ignorant of his schemes. He has schemes to, to tempt us and to lead us astray. But we have to listen to the good shepherd, listen to his voice. We have to know that nothing could separate us from his love. We have to know that there's plots and schemes aloof, that there's stuff going on. We have to know that in this world, there's the God of this age, lowercase g, that there's all types of idols and idolatry and things are trying to take us and make us lead us astray. We have to know that we can't go that route. We have to stay focused on Jesus Christ. You see, he is the good shepherd, but that slide wolf that sneaky wolf the devil he's trying to take your life today he has plots and schemes to take you out he's, he's successful in a lot of us but by, uh, praise God by the blood of Jesus Christ we're safe and our eternal security is in good shape in our salvation but the thing is is this 
While you're on this planet, you want to have joy. While you're on this planet, you may know the Lord, but the dude you bump into at the store, he doesn't know him. So you need to tell him. And the only way he's going to listen to you is if you have something different than him. That same troubles, same trials, same hard times, same struggles. But you got a better perspective. And you say, you know what? It may be pretty tough. But I got a God in heaven who loves me. And I'm going to go be there someday. Don't be ignorant of his schemes with that sly wolf. See, the, the word of God tells us the devil's like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. Hey, we resist him. Resist him by standing firm in the faith. Because word up, misery loves company. But I love Jesus, and he's so awesome and mighty and, and full of goodness. You see, he's the good shepherd. You better listen to him. <laughs> you see, amen, glory to Jesus. But the Lord's goal, remember the Lord's goal, is so that we may have the abundant life. A life full of peace, a life full of joy, hallelujah, joy, peace, and contentment. Those are big words. I tell you what, even being a believer, some of us can't grasp those all the time. But he has to, He offers us those today. We just have to turn to him every day. It's a split-second decision, right? You see, what do they say? Don't be ignorant of the devil's schemes. There's like pawns in the chessboard of life. There's killjoys, right? Oh, and the boss at work, one of them comes up. He says, don't go near that dude. He's a killjoy. Guess what I said to him? I said, my joy's in the Lord. No one can kill my joy. I could be stupid enough to set it down, pick up a club and club that dude, but I'm not going to kill my joy. It's impossible. <laughs> Look at You see, Jesus offers us peace and joy and contentment, peace and joy to the world and contentment. You see, that's his goal. His goal is that not any of you should perish, but you could come to him. And it's not by any good merits, not by making sure that your good deeds outweigh your bad, not by making sure you cross all the T's and dot all the I's, not by making sure that it's just about him. It's not about me. You see, my goal in my life as a Christian, my goal is to know him better and to make him known. He loves us, church. He loves us. You're the apple of his eye. He knows everything you're going through. He's right there with you the whole time. Look, I want you all to know there's two families, though. God wants a family. He wants to adopt you into his family today if you ain't in it. He wants a family, the family of God. But recognize, we have a father in heaven, but out here, there's a father of lies. And he's trying to lie to you and tell you you ain't worth it. But I want to tell you today, you are. He loves you. He loves every single one of us. He loves us enough to, what to say, no, no greater love than this than one to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's what he calls us, his friends, because we're in on it. We're in the loop. We're in the inner circle. Look, amen, don't want y'all to be ignorant of this. Rejoice in the Lord because your joy is your strength, but there's schemes out there to take it away. You stay focused on Jesus, and you'll keep that joy up. Word up. All right, that's pretty brief. Let's go. We'll pray, all right? Yes. Okay. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that they heard your voice today. Lord, forgive us. We've traded in our joy or set it aside for life's distractions or sin. We've sold our joy for our own sin. Lord, today, as a church body, we want to rededicate our lives to you. Spirit of the living God, oh, Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us today. Refill us today, O oh Lord. Make us new. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for the foolishness of preaching. Thank you for your word, O oh Lord. Thank you for your love. 
Thank you that no matter how far we've gone astray in this prodigal path that we've walked, all that we have to do today, Lord, is to turn to you today and you'll meet us right where we are. Holy Spirit, we invite you to fall fresh on us today, to turn us back to you, set our eyes on you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your loving kindness. Lord, now us as a body, we pray together for that person here who doesn't know you. Holy Spirit, we, we tell you, invite your presence on them so overwhelming and soften their heart and enable them to turn to you. Let them know that there is nothing that they have to do but turn to you. You'll meet them right where they are. Lord, have them turn to you, Lord Jesus, and have them invite you into their hearts, receiving you and the peace and the joy that are in you and the forgiveness of life eternal. You stand at the door and knock. Lord, if anybody hears your voice today, put it on their heart to come up and receive prayer. Put it on their heart to receive the forgiveness of sins. Put it on their heart to uh, live a new life and recognize that you make all things new. If you guys got anything going on in your heart, you come up for prayer. And we thank you for today, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.